This is Chapter 8, The Appendicular Skeleton. So we'll start with an introduction to the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is made up of the bones of the limbs, which means your arms and legs, and their supporting girdles. And when we talk about a girdle in context of the skeleton, we are referring to the bones that connect a limb, so either an arm or a leg, to the trunk, otherwise known as the axial skeleton. So if we look at this picture on the right, so the appendicular skeleton contains 126 bones. The pectoral girdle are the bones that connect the arms to the trunk, and that is the clavicle and scapula. The upper limbs are your arms, so these are your arm bones, you have 60 of them. The pelvic girdle is going to be your two hip bones, and then you have your lower limbs or your legs, which also have 60 bones. So there is a lot of symmetry in the appendicular skeleton, so you'll see a lot of similar features between uh, the upper limb bones and the lower limb bones. For example, they both have 28 phalanges. The appendicular skeleton is dominated by long bones. Remember, these are the bones that have a diaphysis, metaphyses, and epiphyses. You can review that structure in Chapter 6. And also, when you get to lab for the bones, for the appendicular skeleton, you are going to have to be able to tell a left bone from a right bone when you just see the bone laying in front of you. And I want you to remember that when you are looking at images from the textbook to help you, all pictures in the textbook are from bones on the right side of the body. So if you're trying to see how that might differ from a left-sided appendicular bone, you'll need to Google it or perhaps look in your atlas. We will start with the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is made up of the two clavicles, so the left and right clavicle, and two scapulae, so the left scapula and the right scapula. Remember that a girdle is, the, is a word that we use to describe the bones that attach the appendages to the axial skeleton, and since this is the pectoral girdle, we are talking about the bones that attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. Notice that the only direct connection that the pectoral girdle has with the axial skeleton is the medial end of the clavicle, which forms a joint with the manubrium of the sternum. So remember, the manubrium is the upper part of the sternum, and then you have the little jugular notch at the top, and on either side of the jugular notch is where you have the attachment point for the two clavicles. And that is the only spot where the pectoral girdle will actually form a joint with the axial skeleton. The scapula lies behind the thoracic cage, but it's not actually directly attached to the thoracic cage. So here you can see the con only connection to the axial skeleton is the medial end of the clavicle with the manubrium of the sternum. The fact that this is the only connection point for the upper arms means that our shoulders have a lot of mobility, but it also means that they are not a very strong joint. So in Chapter 9, we'll talk about joints in particular and how mobility and strength are usually inversely related. The surfaces of the pectoral girdle are important uh, as sites for muscle attachments, muscles that move the upper limbs. So let's take a closer look at the clavicle. The clavicle is this S-shaped bone that you probably previously referred to as your collarbone, but now you're going to call it your clavicle. The clavicle has two ends. The sternal end articulates with the sternum. So again, we talked about the two places on either side of the jugular notch of the manubrium. That is where the sternal end of the clavicle attaches. And the acromial end, which is actually the largest end, articulates or forms a joint with the scapula. So the acromial end will be over here. And in just a second, you'll see that the part of the scapula that the clavicle attaches to is called the acromion, which is why this is called the acromial end. The clavicle is actually one of the most easily fractured bones but it also heals uh, relatively rapidly. And the two most common ways that people break their clavicle is if you fall and put all your weight on your hands, 
it travels up your arm and of the upper arm bones the weakest point is going to be the clavicle which is part of the pectoral girdle and it can snap in the middle or when you fall directly on your shoulder that can also snap your clavicle all right let's take a closer look at the scapula remember the scapula has no direct connection with the axial skeleton it is connected to the clavicle which is connected to the axial skeleton this makes your shoulder highly mobile but not very strong so as with the axial skeleton make sure you use your learning objectives to guide which structures you need to know because we're not going to cover every marking on every bone and I'm going to focus more on the ones that you are likely uh, going to encounter in your lab class so the scapula has three sides the lateral border is going to be the side that goes at like an angle right and of course this will be the lateral side so it's going to face outward from the middle of your body so this is the side that's going to be closest to your armpit it can also be called the axillary border uh, if you remember axillary is another term for armpit this goes back to your chapter one anatomical terminology then you have the medial border this is more the uh, straight up and down border it's not exactly straight up and down but it's not as slanted as the lateral border of course the medial border will be the one that's facing the most inward and because it faces the vertebral column this is sometimes called the vertebral border and then you have the superior border which is the border on the top some structures to know the spine is a ridge that is found only on the posterior surface of the scapula so remember all images in the textbook are of the right side bone so all three of these images at the bottom are of the right scapula and we're looking at it at three different angles we're looking at the anterior or front view we're looking at the lateral view in the middle and the posterior view on the right so if you notice the spine is on the posterior side of the scapula and it's this large ridge on the back of the scapula so you can see it on the lateral view sticking out on the posterior side you cannot see it on the anterior view the supraspinous fossa is the name for the area above the spine and the infraspinous fossa is the name for the area below the spine here's where root words can help supra means above infra means below so that can help you remember those you also need to know the acromion the acromion is a large posterior process so it means it's on the posterior side and this is the part that articulates or forms a joint with the clavicle remember this is the part that's going to make a joint with the acromial end of the clavicle the acromion is also continuous with the spine so if we start on the right side over here on the posterior view remember this was our spine the ridge along the back and if we follow the spine it curves and becomes the acromion so again if we look at the lateral view we see the spine sticking out and it's going to curve and become the acromion and then from the anterior view you can see it peeking out over the back here here's the acromion and the clavicle is going to come around here and form a joint the joint that the scapula forms with the clavicle is called the acro acromioclavicular joint because you are forming a joint between the acromion and the clavicle the next structure to know is the glenoid cavity this is this slight depressed area on the lateral side of the scapula it's a little bit of a cup shape but it's not very deep this forms the socket of the ball and socket joint of your shoulder although it's not very deep of a socket and again we're going to see in chapter 9 that gives your shoulder a lot of flexibility a, a large range of movement but it makes it not all that strong so the glenoid cavity think of that as the socket for the ball and socket joint that make up the shoulder so the glenoid cavity is going to form a joint with your upper arm bone called the humerus so if you look at the little skeleton picture in the bottom left corner the humerus is your upper arm bone and it's going to form a joint right there with the glenoid cavity so the glenoid cavity is always going to be on the lateral side of the scapula because your joint is going to be over here laterally and the joint that the scapula makes with the humerus 
is called the glenohumeral joint. And you can see how knowing the names of these structures and bones will also help you remember the names of the joints. And the last structure to know for the scapula is the coracoid process. This is an anterior process, so it's on the anterior side of the scapula, and this is a ligament and tendon attachment site. It has like a little dog leg or a little crook to it, so we can see it coming out of the front of the scapula in the left image. On the lateral image, you can again see how it's got a little bend to it. There's the coracoid process there. And you can't really see it from the posterior view. You can see a little hint of it peeking over there behind the spine and the acromion, but not really that good of a view of it. So if you remember, in the axial skeleton chapter, you had a coronoid process to remember. And so I have a little hint to help you remember which process belongs to the scapula and which one belongs to the mandible. So remember that the coracoid process with the second little c belongs to the scapula. And back in chapter 7, we saw a coronoid process with a little n is this, in that uh, same place, and that belongs to the mandible. So that's my little tip for getting those straight and not confusing them. In this section, we will go over the upper limb bones. So each of your upper limbs has an arm. So in the anatomical sense, when we use the word arm, we are actually just referring to the upper arm. This is also known as the brachium. And you have one bone in your arm, and that is the humerus. Then you have a forearm, which is an antibrachium. And the forearm has two bone, bones, the ulna and the radius. Notice that when you're in the anatomical position, remember anatomical position, the arms are out to the side, palms facing forward, the ulna is always going to be medial to the radius. So the radius will be lateral, the ulna will be medial. This is important to establish that this only happens in the anatomical position because the forearm can be rotated, and when it's rotated, the ulna can cross underneath the radius. So in the anatomical position, like shown on the left side here, the radius would be lateral and the ulna would be medial. Then we have the wrist, also known as the carpus. The wrist contains eight carpals. And notice that this is for each upper limb, so if you were to talk about both of your upper limbs, it would be 16 total carpals, eight on each side. Then you have your hand, which is made up of the bones that make up your palm, which are called metacarpals, and you have five on each side. And then you have your fingers, which are made up of bones called phalanges, and you have 14 on each side, so 28 for both hands. So let's look at these bones individually, starting with the humerus. Again, use the learning objectives to pay attention to which structures you need to know. So the head is the rounded projection on the proximal end of the humerus, and this is the part that's going to articulate or form a joint with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. And so this is going to make the glenohumeral joint, which we also sometimes commonly refer to as our shoulder joint. You also have the deltoid tuberosity, which is a projection about halfway down the shaft, and this is the attachment site for the deltoid muscle, which we're going to talk about later this semester when we get to muscles. And then on the next slide, we're going to take a closer look at the distal end of the uh, humerus, and this is the region that contains an area called the condyle which is the articulation site where both the ulna and the radius form a joint with the humerus to make up the joint that we call the elbow. And um, because we need to know the separate parts of the condyle, we're going to take a closer look. So now we're taking a closer look at the distal end of the humerus. So on the left side, I have an anterior view of the distal end of the humerus forming a joint with the radius and the ulna. And then on the right side is a posterior view Again, the humerus forming a joint with the ulna and the radius. We call this the elbow joint. And then at the bottom, I also have a little cartoon drawing of, again, the posterior side and the anterior side of the distal end so that we can locate all of these structures. 
So the condyle, the part that actually forms the joint, is made up of two parts. The first part is called the trochlea. This is a spool-shaped part that forms an articulation with the ulna. And I've highlighted it here for you. Sometimes it's difficult for students to be able to see the difference. So it's a spool-shaped area here that the ulna will wrap around. And the ulna is wrapped around it here, so we don't actually see it because the ulna is in the way. But that's how I put the cartoon version down here so that you could see it. So here's the trochlea on the anterior view and the trochlea on the posterior view. The other part of the condyle is the capitulum, which is a rounded marble-like structure that articulates with the head of the radius. And again, I highlighted it here. You can see a little bit of it over here forming the joint with the radius. And then in the image down below, I also highlighted the capitulum so that you could tell the difference. So the trochlea and the capitulum together make up the condyle, but you also need to know the two subparts. Another structure to know is the olacranon fossa. The olacranon fossa is on the posterior side only, and a fossa is going to be a depression in the surface of the bone, and the ulna has a projection which actually will fit into the olacranon fossa when you extend your elbow, so when you straighten your arm out as much as you can. So here we see the ulna, and it folds up and folds into the olacranon fossa, and then when we take the ulna away in the image down below, you can see the, the uh, deep depression here called the olacranon fossa. And again, this is only on the posterior side. You also need to be able to identify the lateral and medial epicondyles. So epi means above. So these are the uh, areas slightly off to the side and above the condyle. So again, this is where root words can help you. So the lateral epicondyle will be on the lateral side, and there it is shown on the uh, two real bones, and here it is shown on the two cartoon bones at the bottom. And then you have the medial epicondyle on the medial side. So notice again, the ulna is on the medial side, and the radius is on the lateral side. So notice that the ulna is on the same side as the medial epicondyle. So the trochlea is also going to be on the medial side. Notice the radius is lateral, so the capitulum is lateral, and they're on the same side as the lateral epicondyle. So putting all of these together, rather than memorizing as all separate facts, can help you when you're studying. Notice also that between the two epicondyles, the medial epicondyle is larger, and that's really going to help you with identification in the lab, because that will help you determine what side of the bone is the medial side of the bone. The ulnar nerve is a nerve that crosses the medial epicondyle, and when you hit your arm just right, it presses that ulnar nerve into the medial epicondyle, and it gives you a funny tingly feeling in your arm, and that's the area that we call the funny bone. And I have a little picture here that shows the ulnar nerve coming down, and it wraps around that medial epicondyle, so if you hit your elbow just right, and press that nerve up against the uh, epicondyle, it gives you that really funny feeling in your arm. So now let's look at the ulna. So again, remember, in the anatomical position, the ulna is going to be medial to the radius. And in this view, we have an ulna and a radius together. So for this slide, we're focusing only on the ulna. And here's the posterior view to the left and the anterior view to the right. And then we have a smaller lateral view of just the ulna up in the upper right corner. So the first structure to know on the ulna is the olacranon. This is the point of your elbow, so it's going to be found on the posterior surface of the ulna. And you can also see it sticking back here on the lateral view. So this is the point of your elbow, and this is also the part that folds up into the olacranon fossa on the humerus when you extend your arm. So during full extension, it swings up and back into the olacranon fossa of the humerus. You should also notice the trochlear notch, which is this C-shaped structure on the ulna. You can see the C-shape best when you're looking at the lateral view on the right here, but you can also see it from the anterior view because this is on the anterior surface or it's the opposite side of the olacranon. And the trochlear notch is going to form an articulation or a joint with the trochlea of the humerus. So remember, the trochlea was that spool-shaped part of the humeral condyle, 
and this trochlear notch will wrap around that spool shape feature on the humerus. You should also know the head. Now the head of the ulna is going to be distal, on the distal end, so the side that's closest to the wrist, not the side that's closest to the elbow. So the head, um, what's notable about that is that the lateral surface articulates with the radius. So down here you can see the, the ulnar head is actually making a little small joint down here with the radius and that is called the distal radio ulnar joint. And again, we can see the ulnar head here on the anterior view. And then there is a styloid process that comes off of the head. So this is a small little extension and it's easy as seen on the posterior view. And the styloid process of the ulna attaches to some articular cartilage that helps to separate the ulna from your wrist bones or your carpals. One other feature to know is the radial notch. Now this is back up on the proximal side of the ulna. The radial notch is on the side just to the side of the trochlear notch. So you have your C-shaped trochlear notch and just to the side and below it you have this smooth area called the radial notch. And this is going to articulate with the head of the radius as shown in the middle picture here at the proximal radio ulnar joint. So you actually have two joints between the radius and the ulna. The proximal radio ulnar joint will be close to where your elbow is and the distal radio ulnar joint will be down where your wrist is. This is why we went over all of those directions in chapter one. All right, let's look at the radius. Again, remember in the anatomical position, the radius is lateral to the ulna. The radius also has a head, but unlike the head of the ulna, remember the ulnar head is on the distal end next to the wrist. The radial head is on the proximal end next to the elbow. And the radial head, it looks like a head of a nail. It's going to articulate or form a joint both with the capitulum of the humerus. The capitulum was that rounded part of the condyle. And it's also going to slide in and fit right up against the radial notch of the ulna. All right, so the head of the radius articulates with both the capitulum of the humerus and the radial notch of the ulna. The radial tuberosity is this bump that's just below the radial head on the anterior side. And this is an attachment site for a muscle that you've probably frequently just called your biceps but it's actually called your biceps brachii, and we'll go over more when we get to muscles uh, later this semester. And then you should also know the styloid process of the radius, which is this little extension that, that points downward on the distal end of the radius, and this functions to stabilize the wrist joint, and this is the, the bump that you can kind of feel in your wrist at the base of your thumb. You should also know that the interosseous membrane is a fibrous membranous sheet that connects the radius and ulna and helps to stabilize their positions. And again, your root words can help you. Inter means between, osseous means bone. So this is literally a membrane between the bones. So if we move down to the carpals, so the carpals are the eight bones that make up your wrist. So you can see them here in this image from your textbook. You have four proximal and four distal carpals. And it can be a little difficult to see the proximal and distal rows in your textbook image. So I'll put another image here for you so that you can kind of distinguish which four are proximal and which four are distal. So the proximal row will be the row closest to the wrist. And that's going to be your scaphoid, your lunate, your triquetrum and your pisiform and then the distal row will be the row that's closest to the uh, hand and that would be your trapezium, your trapezoid, your capitate and your hamate. And notice that of all of the carpals the capitate is the largest one. So related to the carpal bones is carpal tunnel syndrome. You've probably heard of this, known someone who had it, maybe even have it yourself. So right above the carpals, there's a ligament that runs, that crosses this area. It's called the flexor retinaculum. 
And so underneath this ligament, there is a, it's a tunnel, it's a space where uh, nerves and tendons can pass through. And one of the nerves is called the median nerve. And so when you get uh, inflammation in this area, like from uh, overuse injuries, it can compress the median nerve and cause numbness and pain in the hands. Now we'll look at the metacarpals and the phalanges. And so in the upper right pic uh, picture, this is from your textbook. And then in the upper left, I have a color coded uh, picture that can help us see these different bones a little better. So you have five metacarpal bones in each hand, and these form the palm of your hand. And we label them with Roman numerals, with the Roman numeral one being assigned to the lateral side, which is gonna be, always be your thumb. So remember, your thumb is always lateral, your thumb is next to your radius, and your pinky or little finger is always medial, and that is next to your ulna. So we start with the thumb side and we label them one, two, three, four, and five in Roman numerals. So this bone right here that I'm circling with my mouse would be metacarpal four, and I would write that as IV. I've labeled the little color-coded hand as well. Again, we start with the thumb side and we go across and label them one through five in Roman numerals. The carpals are also shown down here in purple and we covered those on the previous slide. So the phalanges, so you have 14 phalanges in each hand and the phalanges can be divided into three regions. There are proximal phalanges, which are the, gonna be the ones that are closest to the palm of your hand and they are shown in light green in this upper left image. Your middle phalanges will be the ones in the middle, obviously, and they're in the blue color. And then you have distal phalanges, which would be the ones that's the farthest away from the palm of your hand. So if you'll notice the thumb and another, another name for the thumb, um, this was taught to you in chapter one, is called the pollex. The thumb only has two phalanges, right? So the thumb only has a proximal and a distal. So if we look on the side where we have the metacarpal one labeled, so that's our thumb side, you notice the thumb only has two phalanges. There's no blue one here. All of your other four fingers, so fingers two, three, four, and five, all have three phalanges each, so they all have a proximal phalange, a middle phalange, and a distal phalange. Uh, technically, the term for a single bone, a single one of these bones is a phalanx, so phalanx is singular, phalanges is plural. So if I were going to label one of these bones, like this one right here, I would say that this is the proximal phalanx of the third finger, right? So it's the proximal bone, and it's the third finger over, so it's the proximal phalanx of the third finger. Or, just for another example, if I were to label this bone, that would be the distal phalanx of the pollux, because remember, pollux is another name for the thumb. In this section, we're gonna go over the pelvic girdle. So the pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones. These are also referred to as coxal bones, and you may also see them referred to as os coxi, or a singular one would be os coxa without the E on the end. So a few different names, and we're talking about there's a left and a right hip bone. Remember again, a girdle refers to the bones that attach the appendages to the axial skeleton. So in the case of the pelvic girdle, the connection is between the hip bone and the sacrum. So each hip bone attaches to the sacrum at this area called the auricular surface, which is on a part of the hip bone called the ilium. So here is your connection to the axial skeleton. The hip bone itself is made up of three bones that fuse together during development. So you have the ilium, which is shown in red, the ischium, which is shown in green, and the pubis, which is shown in yellow. And in the next slide, we're gonna go over some different structures that you need to know on the hip bone, including needing to know uh, these three bones that make up the total hip bone. So the ilium is the superior most portion, the pubis is like on the anterior medial side, and the ischium is on the posterior, posterior lateral side. All right, so here's the view from your textbook. We have a view of the right hip bone, the lateral view on the left side, 
and the medial view on the right side. So this is just one of the two hip bones. And at the top, we have color-coded images so that you can see the components um, of the total hip bone that are made up by the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. So one structure to know is the obturator foramen. And this is the hole at the bottom of the hip bone. And you can see it up here at the top that it's between the pubis and the ischium. This is a space that is enclosed by collagen fibers. And it's also a space through which some blood vessels and nerves run. It is not the space where the hip forms a joint. Sometimes students have that misconception. So here is a picture of the put together pelvis. And you can see the obturator foramen, the holes down here at the bottom and it's covered with that membrane called the obturator membrane, and you have a small gap through which vessels and blood, uh, nerves and blood vessels can pass. And again, this is not the uh, articulation point for the femur, so don't think that that's what those holes are for. The place where the femur is gonna form a joint with the hip bone is called the acetabulum, and it's most easily seen on the lateral side of the hip bone. This is a concave socket that the head of the femur fits into. So this is another ball and socket joint like, like we saw with the glenoid cavity in the head of the humerus, except this one is, has a much deeper socket and it makes for a stronger joint. And on the picture at the top on the, this view here on the left side, you can see the acetabulum is actually composed a little bit of all three bones. So the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis all come together um, and fuse in the area known as the acetabulum. So now let's look at some structures that are broken um, up between these three bones. So just to remind you, the hip bone is made up of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And I matched the colors on my slide with this image from your textbook at the top here with the purpley color being the ilium. That is your superior most bone. The ischium is the one in yellow, and that is more posterior lateral and the pubis is the one in pink, and that is more anterior and medial. So let's look at a few structures, starting with the iliac crest, which is this broad ridge at the very top of the ilium, and it's an important attachment site for a lot of muscles. The iliac fossa is going to be found on the uh, front or the anterior side of the hip bone, and it's gonna be on the ilium, and it's sort of this depressed uh, area, it's sort of like slightly concave underneath the iliac crest. You also can see the greater sciatic notch on the ilium, which is this really big notch right here. You can see it on the medial view and on the lateral view. And then the auricular surface, which we already mentioned, this is the place where the ilium is going to form an articulation with the sacrum. And this is the connection of the pelvic girdle to the axial skeleton. So it's this rough area right here, and it is only found on the medial anterior side of the ilium. So it's facing forward, so it's on the anterior side, and it's on the medial side because the uh, sacrum would sit medially. All right, if we look at the ischium, the ischium has the lesser sciatic notch, which is a smaller notch underneath this ischial spine. And then another feature to know is the ischial tuberosity, which is this thickened region of the ischium. And this is kind of like the butt bone you sit on. So this bears all of your weight when you're sitting. And so if you've ever sat in a really hard seat and it feels like your, your bones of your butt is gonna come through the uh, gluteus maximus of your butt, then you're, you're actually feeling the ischial tuberosities. And then the pubis doesn't have any structures on it that we want you to know for this semester, but you do need to know that it connects to the other hip bone. So each hip bone, remember this is one hip bone, each hip bone has all three areas. So one hip bone is gonna to connect to the other hip bone at the pubis, and there's a pad of fibrocartilage in between the one hip bone and the other hip bone that's made up um, of fibrocartilage, and that's called the pubic symphysis. And you'll see that a little bit better when we get to the um, section describing the pelvis. So just, I wanted to point out the sciatic notches to you again. So this is all of the bones put together. So we have our right and left hip bone put together. We see the sacrum, we see some of the lumbar vertebrae, we see the uh, femur here. And so the greater sciatic notch was this large notch up here on the ilium. 
And it's called that because the sciatic nerve passes right through that notch. And the sciatic nerve is a major nerve that is made up of multiple spinal nerves. And so it crosses over this uh, greater sciatic notch and then continues down into the leg. The lesser sciatic notch is this one underneath that small spine. The greater, the, uh, sorry, the sciatic nerve does not pass through the lesser sciatic notch, but there are some other nerves and blood vessels that do pass there. And I bring this up because most everyone has heard of sciatica. Sciatica is when you have uh, the, the sciatic nerve gets pinched somewhere up here in the hip region, and then that causes uh, pain and numbness that can radiate down the affected leg. In this section, we're going to go over the structure known as the pelvis. The pelvis is actually composed of four bones. So you have two hip bones, the right and the left hip bone, the sacrum, and the coccyx. So two bones from the appendicular skeleton, two bones from the axial skeleton. Now this entire structure all together is called the pelvis. So like when you're doing identification on exams or quizzes or even in lab, be very careful with your terminology because if you answer a question with pelvic bone, that is kind of too vague, right? If you say a pelvic bone, that could easily be any one of these four bones because the pelvis is made up of all four bones. So use accurate terminology. So for example, if you just want to talk about this bone here, that's a hip bone or an os coxa, right? If you just want to talk about this bone, that's the sacrum or just this bone is the coccyx, right? When you use the word pelvis, you are referring to all four of them together. And this image is all, uh, allows us to see the pubic symphysis that we mentioned on a previous slide. So the pubic symphysis is this fat pad of fibrocartilage that is between the left and right pubis bones. So that is the pubic symphysis. And that gives a little bit of flexibility uh, to the pelvis and is especially important during childbirth in women. When talking about the pelvis, we can also differentiate between the true pelvis and the false pelvis. So we mentioned back in chapter one that the pelvic cavity is the space enclosed by the bones of the pelvis. And so that comes up again because we're discussing the pelvis. The true pelvis is going to be the bottommost area. It runs from the top of the sacrum to the pel uh, pubic symphysis, and then it's all of this portion down below that is enclosed by both the hip bone, the sacrum, and the coccyx. So that area shown in purple here is known as the true pelvis. It's also known as the lesser pelvis because it's the bottommost region. And this area that runs from the base of the sacrum to the pubic symphysis along a structure called the arcuate line, that is um, the, called the pelvic brim. So all of the area below the pelvic brim is the true pelvis. The pelvic inlet is going to be the opening to this region. So the pelvic inlet will be the top of the true pelvis. And the pelvic outlet is going to be the bottommost region that runs from the bottom of the pubic symphysis to the bottom of the coccyx. So the inlet will be the top portion, the outlet will be the bottom portion. The false pelvis is a term that we use for the area above the pelvic brim, but still falls within the range of the uh, ilium. So these ilial bl iliac blades that come up as part of the hip, hip bones, this area up here would be the false pelvis or the greater pelvis because it sits on top. And then with the pelvic outlet, the pelvic outlet is where you would find the perineal muscles that form the floor of the pelvic cavity. So these are all of the muscles that you would find down in the perineal region. So the pelvis has quite a few differences between the male and the female. So we're going to go over a few of those differences that you should know. If we start with the pubic angle, which is the angle between the right and left pubic bones, in the male pelvis, this angle is more narrow, so it's 90 degrees or less. And in the female pelvis, this angle is larger, so it's 100 degrees or more. The sacrum in males has a very pronounced curvature, and I have another picture in a few minutes to show you. And the sacrum in the females has a much less curvature. And the, reason, the reasons for these differences have to do with childbirth. 
So the male pelvis does not have to uh, worry about childbirth, the female pelvis does. And the baby develops up here in the abdominal pelvic region. And so to be delivered, the baby has to pass through the pelvic inlet and outlet to pass through the vagina and be born. So the female pelvis has to accommodate the passage of a uh, relatively large baby through this area. So you don't want the sacrum to be too curved or, you know, it might get in the way of the baby, whereas males don't have to worry about that, so their sacrum can be very curved. The coccyx in, in males, it wraps around and points anteriorly. Again, that would get in the way of a baby, so in females, it points straight down or inferiorly. The ilium in males extends farther superiorly, so sometimes they have a much more narrow-looking hips. You can't always see the defined hip bones, whereas in females, the uh, ilium is broader and it projects more laterally, and this gives females that typical curvy hip look uh, that a lot of females have. And again, this is to provide more area to hold a baby as it develops. And the pelvic inlet is going to be heart-shaped in the male pelvis. And it's going to be much larger and oval to round in shape in the female pelvis. And again, that is because that is where the baby's going to pass through. And the pelvic inlet is shown in these pictures by the pink arrow. And then during birth, females have an even an extra adaptation. They secrete a hormone called relaxin toward the end of the pregnancy, right before birth happens. And this uh, particular hormone causes the pubic symphysis to become more flexible which is going to allow the uh, pelvic bones, so all four pelvic bones, to be able to shift a little bit more, um, again, to allow the passage of the baby through that channel. So you can see a lot of the big differences uh, in this image. So in this image, the male pelvis is on the um, right side and the female pelvis is on the left side, right? So you, this will help you see the difference in the curvature of the sacrum and the coccyx. So in the male pelvis, the sacrum has a pronounced curvature and the coccyx comes down and points anteriorly. Whereas in the female pelvis, you have less curvature of the sacrum and the coccyx points more inferiorly. And again, that's because we have to get a baby through here and over here the baby will get hung up. And in this section, we will talk about the lower limb bones. So the lower limbs, each lower limb has one thigh which contains a femur. You have a knee which is made up of the patella. In anatomy, the term leg actually refers to your lower legs. So you have two lower legs uh, with one bone or two bones each, a tibia and a fibula. And notice that like with the uh, ulna and radius in the forearm, the tibia is always medial and the fibula is always lateral. One difference between these two bones and the bones of your forearm is these cannot rotate around each other like the ulna and radius can. So the tibia will always be medial and the fibula will always be lateral. One little handy tip to try to remember these uh, and remember the names, the separate names. Tibia sounds a bit like tuba, which is a large instrument and fibula has some of the same letters as flute, which is a smaller, finer, thinner instrument. So the tibia is much, much larger than the fibula. Then you have your ankles, also known as the tarsus region. The ankles do include what we refer to as the heel of our foot. So it might be a little weird thinking of that as being part of your ankle, but it is in anatomical terms. The ankle contains seven tarsal bones, each ankle, so you have 14 in total. So if you really want to classify the bones of the foot, this region here from the bottom of the tibia and fibula to basically the start of the sole of your foot, that is all the ankle. So a lot of people just think of the ankle as being up here, but your ankle bones are actually all in the heel of your foot. And then the foot part is actually the sole, the ball, and the toes. We actually used to walk on four legs in our past evolutionary history. And animals that still walk on their four legs, you can see how their ankle is up and above the ground. They usually don't put weight on their ankles. 
Um, this is an example of a cat, this cat skeleton. So that part in the back that some people might mistake for a knee is actually an ankle. The knee is actually in the front. Same thing with dogs, right? The knee is in the front and that part in the back that you see with their, at the ends of their long feet, that is their ankle. And so it's the similar structure as ours. The only difference is after we evolved to walk upright, we flattened our foot and now we put weight on the ankle region. So if we look at the region called the foot, we have the sole of the foot shown here, and that consists of five metatarsals on each side. And then you have the toes, which contains 14 phalanges on each side. So let's look at the femur. The femur is the largest, heaviest bone in the body. The head of the femur articulates with the pelvis at the acetabulum. So it fits into the acetabulum on each hip bone. And notice that this is uh, very much like a ball structure that fits into the socket of the acetabulum. And this is one of your two ball and socket joints. Also notice that the head always points medially. So when you're trying to identify which side's the lateral side, which side's the medial side, remember that the head is always going to be on the medial side. The neck is the region where the head joins the shaft and it joins at an angle of about 125 degrees. And then you've got a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. And these are attachment sites for very large tendons that attach very large leg muscles. So the greater trochanter is always going to be lateral to the neck I mean, and to the head. So you have the head on the medial side. The greater trochanter is going to be on the lateral surface. And the lesser trochanter is going to be on the medial surface, the same side as the head. It's also smaller than the uh, greater trochanter. Now, just like we did with the humerus, we're going to take a closer look at the condyle region on the distal end of the femur, and this will be the region where you have your knee joint. So if we take a closer look at the distal end, down here we have two condyles, a medial condyle and a lateral condyle, and these are going to articulate with the tibia. And luckily, the early anatomists didn't go too crazy with their naming because the lateral condyle of the femur will articulate with the lateral condyle of the tibia, and the medial condyle of the femur will articulate with the medial condyle of the uh, tibia. Notice that, again, if you're looking at a bone all by itself in lab and your instructor is asking you to identify which one is the lateral condyle and which one is the medial condyle, the medial condyle is always going to be on the same side as the head because the head points medially. I've also highlighted these condyles in these smaller images down at the bottom that give you a little bit better view. So again, uh, the medial condyles are these two in the middle. This is the anterior surface on the left and the posterior surface on the right. And so the lateral condyle, condyle is on the outside in this example. You also should know the intercondylar fossa. So again, root words will help you. Inter means between. Condyles are points of uh, joints. Fossa is a depression or like a sunken in area. So this is a basically a hole or a depression between the condyles. And in fact, that's where it's located. It's located between the two condyles only on the posterior surface of the femur. So just have, like we had the olacranon fossa in the humerus, we have the intercondylar fossa in the femur. And I'm going to color it in for you down here so you can see it's this really deep divot or hole between the two condyles. So intercondylar fossa. The patellar surface is a very smooth area that's also between the condyles, except this time it's on the anterior surface. So intercondylar fossa is on the posterior surface. Patella surface is on the anterior side. I've highlighted it for you down here in the other little image. And this is where your patella or your kneecap is going to sit and form a joint. So speaking of the patella, remember pat the patella is a sesamoid bone. It's the one sesamoid bone we all have in common. Go back to your bone shapes in Chapter 6 to review. And sesamoid bones form within tendons, and the patella in particular forms within the tendon of the quadriceps fulmoris, 
which is a group of four muscles we commonly call the quads and which we'll cover later in the semester when we get some muscles. So the patella has a base at the top. Remember, base is the widest part. It doesn't mean that it's at the bottom. It means it's the widest part. And it has an apex at the bottom, which is the more narrow region. The posterior or back surface of the patella has two uh, concave facets where it can articulate with the femur. So here's a picture of it sitting on the femur. So you can see this is an inferior view of the femur. So we're looking up from the bottom of the femur. We get a nice view of the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. You also have a nice view of the intercondylar fossa. Again, this is the space between condyles and you can really see it in that picture. And then the patella is on the anterior surface and it sits right in there like that where these facets will line up with associated facets on the femur. The patella is actually 100% cartilage when you're born, so it's still made of cartilage. It doesn't start ossifying until you learn to walk and regularly put weight on your legs. So it will start ossifying usually about around age two, and then it won't be completely ossified until you hit puberty. The normal movement of the patella in this joint is superior and inferior. So if you hold your hand over your knee while you extend it and flex it, you can see the patella moves up and down. If the patella ever slips and starts moving in the lateral medial direction, this causes a lot of inflammation and pain known as runner's knee. Um, this can happen from like improperly placing your feet while you're running or wearing bad shoes or depending on the surface that you run on, etc. Moving on to the tibia, the tibia is the second largest bone in the body. It is the large bone that is on the medial side of your leg. And it has medial and lateral condyles that articulate with the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, as I mentioned before. So you have a medial tibial condyle that's going to form a joint with the medial uh, condyle on the femur and you have a lateral tibial condyle which will form a joint with the lateral condyle on the femur. And I'll tell you in just a second how to tell those two apart. The two condyles are separated by a little ridge and this is most easily seen from the posterior view. So here's a little ridge between the two condyles and that is called the intercondylar eminence. So again, between the condyles and an eminence is a name for a little ridge. There is also a tibial tuberosity that's on the anterior side just below the condyles. So it's a little bump right there on the front of the bone. This is the site of attachment for the patellar ligament. The anterior margin of the tibia has sort of a razor sharp edge. Well, not razor sharp, but it's a pretty sharp uh, edge. And this is the the edge that you can feel through the front of your um, leg. It's like what you call your shin or your shin bone. You're feeling that anterior margin of the tibia. And then the tibia also has a structure called the medial malleolus. It's down here on the distal end. So this is the large process. It forms a joint with the ankle and this actually makes up that medial bump that you feel on the inside of your legs. Right, so this is your medial ankle bump. So if I put a little picture here, right, so this would be on the inside of your leg, so on the same side as your big toe, that big bump you feel right there, that is the medial malleolus. So going back to the condyles, when you're trying to identify which one's lateral and which one's medial, whichever condyle is on the same side as the medial malleolus will be the medial condyle. So when, again, when you're in lab and trying to determine what parts of the bone are what, and they're not attached to any other bones, keep that in mind. The inferior surface, so the surface right underneath the tibia is where you're gonna have articulation with the proximal ankle bones. And we'll see that when we get to the ankle. So the other leg bone is the fibula. This is the much, much smaller lateral bone. In fact, the fibula does not bear any weight at all, so it is a non-weight bearing bone. In fact, it doesn't even touch the femur, so it has no connection to the femur. It only connects the tibia at the proximal end 
and at the distal end, and then it forms some connections with some of the ankle bones, but it does not touch uh, the femur. Therefore, none of the weight that is distributed down through your skeleton will pass through the fibula. It does provide an attachment site for muscles that move the feet and the toes. And the head of the fibula is going to be on the proximal side, so up here close to the knee. And the head of the fibula is only going to form a joint with the tibia. So you're going to have a tibiofibular joint, and that's going to be on the proximal side or the superior side. Um, and again, it does not form a joint with the femur. The lateral malleolus is at the distal end of the uh, fibula, so it's down here next to the ankle side. And this is going to provide lateral stability for your ankle joint, and this makes up your ankle bump on the outside of your leg. So this is your outer ankle bump. So if we take a picture of your ankle, the lateral malleolus is going to be the bump on the outside, the same side as your little pinky toe. And if you remember, the medial malleolus is going to be the bump on the inside, the same side as your big toe. Just like the ulna and radius were connected by an interosseous membrane, the tibia and fibula are also connected by an interosseous membrane. It has the same structure as the one in your forearm, only this one connects uh, the two leg bones. Potts fracture is a type of fracture of the meat or one or more of the, of the malleoli in the ankle. So a really bad ankle twist can fracture either the lateral malleolus on the uh, fibula, which is shown here, or the medial malleolus on the tibia, which is shown here, um, or both of them. So these are graded based on the severity. So a first degree POTS fracture means you fractured either the fibula or the tibia, and a second degree uh, POTS fracture, you would have fractured both. And you can do this with a really bad ankle twist. Don't do it. All right, so if we look at your tarsals, sorry, I left my arrows showing, but each of your uh, ankles contains seven tarsal bones. And as I mentioned earlier, these are kind of in what you consider to be your foot, but they are actually ankle bones. So you need to know two of them. The first one is called the talus. This articulates with the tibia. So the tibia is going to sit right on top of it. So the bottom of the tibia is a very smooth surface, and it's going to sit like right over this trochlea that is on the talus. And then on the lateral side of the talus, you actually also will form a joint with the fibula. And I've outlined the boxes for you, but I'm also going to highlight the bone. So there, I've highlighted the talus in both of these images. So the talus is going to be right underneath the tibia. The other ankle bone you should remember is the calcaneus. This is the largest of the tarsals. It's also the bone that we frequently call our heel bone, and it bears most of the body's weight when standing. So it's this really large bone that is underneath the talus, and then it also goes back to make our heel. And so there, I've colored those in for you. So those are the two tarsals you need to know, the talus and the calcaneus. And then when we're also talking about how our weight is distributed, our weight when we're standing passes down through the vertebral column. Remember, that's why the vertebral bodies get larger and larger and larger the farther down you go in the vertebral column. Then the weight's going to pass through your hip bones, then to your very large femur, then through your tibia, which is also a very large bone, then down into your talus, then down into the calcaneus, and then out into the floor. So that is the way our weight is distributed when we stand. The calcaneus is also an attachment site for the calcaneal tendon. And this is a tendon that used to be called the Achilles tendon, but now we're getting away from things named after people, so we're calling it the calcaneal tendon. But this is that tendon that you can see on the back of your foot. And then we come to the metatarsals and phalanges. So just like with the metacarpals, we had five of them. They were numbered with Roman numerals. It's the same thing with the metatarsals. We have five metatarsals, they get Roman numerals one through five, and you are going to number these. Actually, in this case, we're gonna number from medial to lateral. So this is one big difference between the foot and the hand. In the hand, we numbered them from lateral to medial, but we still started with our largest finger, which is our thumb. 
And in the case of the foot, we're going to number them medial to lateral, but we're still starting with the big guys. So we still start with the big toe. So the same side as the big toe would be metatarsal one, then you have metatarsal two, metatarsal three, four, and five. So just remember that your thumb is always lateral when you're in the anatomical position, but your foot, your big toe is always medial, all right? Then just like with the hands, you've got 14 phalanges in each foot. So each hand had 14 phalanges, each foot has 14 phalanges. That means you have 56 total phalanges in your body. We call the thumb the pollux, if you recall. We call the big toe the hallux. So those are terms you should know. They, they go all the way back to chapter one. And just like the thumb, the hallux only has two phalanges. So it only has the proximal and the distal phalanx. It does not have the middle phalanx. And then your other four toes, they all have three phalanges each, a proximal, a middle, and a distal, which is shown down here in the color-coded picture. Even your tiny little baby toe has three bones, a proximal, middle, and distal phalange. So again, if I was to label a specific bone in the toes, I would call like this one right here would be the middle phalanx of the second toe. So just a reminder, phalanx is singular, phalanges is plural. Stress fractures that runners can often get usually involve very small hairline fractures in the metatarsals. And they can be caused by wearing improper shoes or running on um, uneven ground or just having repeated shocks and impacts when your body hasn't built up to it. So um, stress fractures, that's just a, a piece of knowledge to know. They usually do involve the metatarsals. We have a brief little section here on the arches of the foot. So you have two types of arches within your foot. The first one is called a longitudinal arch. And so longitudinal, think of the word long, so it goes the long ways around, um, along your foot. And this functions in the weight transfer. And it runs from the calcaneus to the distal end of the metatarsals. So what we mean by weight transfer is, for example, if normally you walk with your heel on the ground, but if you were to like uh, stand on your tippy toes or on the ball of your foot, the, these um, arches or axes are gonna help transfer the weight from the calcaneus forward into your metatarsals. You actually have both a medial and lateral longitudinal arch. So if we look at this little picture down here on the left side where you see the A, B, and C on the bottom of the foot, again, longitudinal arches are gonna be the long ways. So A and C and B and C are two longitudinal arches. So the B and C one, that would be the lateral longitudinal arch because it's on the same side as your pinky toe. A to C would be your medial longitudinal arch because it's on the same side as your big toe. The medial arch actually has more curve to it. You can see that in someone's footprint, like a footprint left behind in sand. So the side that you normally see no impression, that is the medial side where you have a more curved arch. Some people may have different types of curvature to their arches. So some people may have higher arches and they would leave a footprint like this, or some people may have lost their arches and they would leave a footprint like this. The transverse arch is the curvature from the medial to the lateral borders. So that's shown here by this gray area. So now we're just going from one side of the foot to the other. And if we look at this image down here on the left, that would be going like from A to B or B to C. So that is the transverse arch. And as I mentioned, people with a condition called flat foot or flat feet, this is where your arches are lost or they never formed in the first place. Some people with either no arches or high arches might have no symptoms. Others might have foot pain and they develop all kinds of shoes and arch supports to help people with different curvatures to their foot. And the last section is on age-related changes to the skeleton. I put this table from your textbook. I'm not going to sit here and read it uh, word for word. Most of the stuff we've talked about in other chapters. For example, the first line talking about the bony matrix and how it reduces in mineral content and it starts around age 30. We talked about that um, in chapter six. Um, 
we didn't mention, but bone markings also reduce in size and roughness over, over your lifespan. We did talk about the fontanelles in Chapter 7 and how they close by the age of 2. Um, we talked about um, how the mandible, when you have a reduction in bone mass due to osteopenia, that can cause you to lose teeth. Um, we talked about the curvature in the vertebrae and how you develop those secondary curves after you learn to hold your head up and then learn to walk. Uh, we've talked about how intervertebral discs um, deteriorate over time and that can cause you to lose height. Um, we've talked about the epiphyseal cartilages in your long bones and once they fuse and you have no cartilage left, your bones no longer get any longer. Um, and so this is just a summary of skeletal changes that we have pretty much covered in other sections of other chapters. And that is it for chapter 8. So can anybody tell what bone that is in the dog's mouth? I'm pretty sure it's a femur. I can't see the head down here, but uh, I see a very deep intercondylar fossa. So other mammals have the same bones. So if you see a femur of a cow, for example, it's going to have a lot of the same structures as our femur. And that's the end of chapter 8.